الله الرحمن الرحيم نستأنف بعون الله جلسات هذه الندوة بالجلسة الثالثة الندوة الثالثة second access عن العصر البرونزي لكن أولا أود شخصيا أن أسجل شكري الجزيل للإخوة على دعوتهم الكريمة لي وللزملاء بصفة خاصة أود أن أسجل اقتباطي وسعادتي بما رأيته وأراه من نشاط حثيث وملموس بالنسبة لتنمية حقل الآثار في الكويت الشقيقة وهذا يعبر عن الرغبة الأكيدة من قبل السلطة ومن قبل المختصين وعدد المختصين الذين تكاثروا في الآونة الأخيرة في هذا الحقل يدل على شغف كبير ما بين الشباب والشابات الكويتيات لدراسة هذا العلم والأهم من ذلك أنه فتح الباب للمجالات الأوسع للبعثات الأجنبية وما فيلقى وتنقيباتها والمسوحات الأثرية فيها إلا دلالة واضحة على هذا الزخم من العمل الأثري المثمر وما سمعناها اليوم وما سنسمع غدا وبعد غد من نتائج تؤهل الكويت للمصافة الأولى في حقل العمل الأثري أعتقد بعد هذه المقدمة أود أن أتحدث باللغة الإنجليزية وقدم الإخوة في هذه الجلسة جلسة العصر البرونزي uh, on uh, my right is Dr. Carol Peter who is going to speak to us about the Bronze Age settlement in Al Khidr and on my left Dr. Aisha Abu Laban who is going to talk to us about the style two stamp seals made in Failaka and uh, next to her is uh, Ms. Ms. Anne Hilton she is going to speak on new light on the old stone age a study of stone vessels from the second millennium BC. Before we proceed, I think it's worthwhile to repeat the, uh, the rules of the game. It's about 20 minutes per speaker, and we postpone the uh, discussion until after the last speaker. And we hope that with the ample time remaining, we will devote more time to the discussion which I personally think is the most, most fruitful aspect of getting together in, 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 in scientific uh, colloquium like this. So without further ado, Dr. Peter. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, present for you the Bronze Age settlement the Slovak Archaeological Mission since 2004 this paper is going back uh, to, to the uh, work of different uh, mission members, uh, mainly of these our mission, besides excavating of uh, our Kidder, uh, was also conducted uh, activities on the island accord agreement. The other sites, circles, were surveyed, mapped, uh, and or geophysically prospected. In my presentation, I will focus on the research of Arctic site the site is situated on the north western coast uh, in the circle of Ailaka Island, uh, on the western shore of the horseshoe-shaped uh, promontory that is referred to as a harbor in traditional sources. The site uh, Arctic started to be excavated <laughs> Uh, we did a multi-disciplinary uh, research project having a different uh, basic research questions. Uh, determination of the chronology of the site, its, its extent, uh, 
spatial organization and development في فيلك وفي الخليج بشكل عام مواد او تخصصات الدراسات الماديه وعلم الاثار الرقمي The mapping and survey, the general plan, and the, uh, in the uh, 3D uh, map of the three modes uh, of the of the site. Uh, shortly to the geophysics, it were uh, three methods employed. الجغرافية الفيزيائية استعملنا التقنيات الكهرومغناطيسية والرادار الجغرافي Uh, the best results were reached uh, by the electromagnetic as well as uh, radar measurements. Uh, the excavations was based uh, on the contextual, contextual uh, approach. إذا استندت أعمال التنقيب على مقاربة سياقية. The excavation method of both soundings and trenches was based on on this approach. And all situations was recorded using the total station and leveling machines. وقد استخدمنا آلات مختلفة للقيام بأعمال التنقيب. It has to be mentioned that the site turned out to be considerably damaged by water and wind erosion. وتبين أن الموقع متضرر من أعمال التعرية بالمياه والهواء. On the easternmost portions of the site, middle and mostly it's a human impact is well recognized. is able uh, by digging pits uh, as well as uh, also the war uh, destructions uh, gulf war هذا الى جانب الدمار الذي خلفته الحرب واثر البشر على الموقع to the sequence of the site occupation besides bronze age also post purchase uh, bronze age Single amphora found, as well as skeleton from the C14 dated skeleton from the 13th century AD, and then late Islamic traces as. This portable, portable kiln, for example. I don't. However, the main occupation of the and usage of the site comes from the from the Bronze Age. Let's preserve the horizon of the Arcadi. Is the layer free with two sublayers A and B? This layer is represented by the architectural remains of rectangular layouts, and as well as deposits of shells, bitumen, gypsum-like matters. Leveling activities. Development of the settlement according to the GIS imaginary analysis of the northern part of the excavated area. 
منطقة التنقيب هذه عينة عنها divided on the five uh, centimeter uh, slices you can see the, the most complicated يمكنكم uh, layers of تروا الطبقات بشكل اكثر تفصيلا as well as the general view وهذه هي it is important to mention that thanks to uh, GIS analysis, although the post uh, uh, could have been uh, defined on the site that represents already abandoned uh, and gradually dislapidating settlement. يظهر وجود مستوطنات متقاربة ومقسمة بشكل معين. Now uh, I want to present you the gradual uh, development. سوف أعرض عليكم uh, التطور التدريجي. Through the uh, small finds. من خلال هذه الخطوط الرفيعة. Besides uh, spatial shifting and changing in the de uh, density of the finds from the west <coughs> to east trenches. هناك اختلاف في سمك الطبقات التي عثرنا عليها. Also the density of the individual small fine types with respect to to the elevation of the discovery show the similar picture during the three B peak of occurrence of kappa. It's the 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 green line. ولكنها كان هناك تغيرا في النشاط في نشاط المستوطنة عبر العصور From the uh, uppermost horizon, best remaining structures are pre uh, preserved up to the height of uh, هناك ايضا بقايا لمستوطنات Unlike those, the Alkidir uh, site yielded only scarce evidence of the interior uh, furnishing of the settlement units, apart uh, from the large number of stone interpreted as a fireplaces. Rebuilding uh, and of interiors are well documented uh, Masonry uh, show the superposition, reorganization as are on the pictures here. Uh, of the pictures here. Of the of Renewing and rebuilding phases uh, of the settlement. And also, there was a delay on excavating uh, structures. The estimated extent uh, of uh, the bronze uh, age site. This bronze You can good see the three mounds. The only the the first one uh, was. Uh, documented and excavated. As the digital uh, 3D model of Failaka shows, when the sea level uh, is one meter higher than today, كانت الجزيرة أكثر ارتفاعا بمتر واحد مما هي عليها اليوم. وقد غرق جزء منها في البحر. 
would be in uh, such a case remaining from the al qaeda side idan hada ma baqiya min mawqi al khadr let's move to to the portable فلننتقل uh, إلى الأدوات القابلة للحمل من موقع الخضر في الصورة ترون ختما عليه خط مسماري Slides you can see the material categories of small files. And there are the different materials for the small files that are used to form the objects. So all objects in the same way. Copper tools, besides those, are examples of copper. So as tweezers and arrowhead and the tools. First of all, the sheets and and the fisher hooks. And this is the tools for the fisher. On one hand, it must stressed that over 700 copper objects was found on Sahar. It is similar to the ratio between Sahar and Al-Qaeda seals. When the size of excavated area on both sides is considered, sometimes even petrified strings occur on the hooks. وتم العثور على سوبستون أوبجيكس من أركيدر أركيدان على الصنارات من أكبر الأوبجيكس هذه بعض الأدوات الحجرية التي تم العثور عليها تم العثور أيضا على آنية حجرية منزلية بأشكال بيضاوية وكانت مزينة أيضا نماذج أخرى عن الأدوات الحجرية وجدنا أيضا كسور من بعض القطع الأثرية الحجرية هذه من فيلكة هذه آنية مكورة هنا لدينا نقوش مع علامة استفهام مقسمة إلى عدة أجزاء الأختام هي أبرز القطع التي تم العثور عليها من خلال أعمال التنقيب لدينا واحد وسبعين ختما يعود لثقافة دلمون بالإضافة إلى أختام مصنوعة من الأصداف المقطعة هذا هو كتالوج الأختام الذي أعده زملاؤنا الفرنسيون هذه بعض الأدوات الحجرية من ضمنها حبات خرز And since the maybe human figure head and a Mesopotamian type of spindle-shaped plate, 
among the rare finds uh, from the from the site. هذه بعض القطع التي تم العثور عليها يمكنكم أن تروا المسكات المصنوعة من النحاس هذه هي قطع فخرية تم العثور عليها أكثر من 400 قطعة عثر عليها وتم توثيقها Seasons was screened and typical pieces were selected, documented, typological, ordered and dated. Then, تم تاريخ وتوثيق كل القطع التي عثرنا عليها. From these two seasons, can be dated to Hurland's Phylaka periods 2A and B. Nevertheless, traces of earlier as well as later. Periods in material occur to seven pottery ware groups were specified on the basis of. كل مجموعة فيها مجموعات فرعية أو فئات فرعية. هذه بعض الأدوات الطينية. حزر الرحى وصحون الخبز على سبيل المثال. Very interesting. There are the bitumen remains. هذه بعض substances bitumen were frequently used as bonding material in buildings. التي كانت تستخدم لتوصيل الأبنية. ولإصلاح الآنية الفخارية ولتسخين في المواقت يمكنكم أن تروا في الوسط أختاما أيضا على هذه المادة مادة البيتومين occur impressions of various plants represent the major bitumen assemblage palm leaves cordage point out to the larger constructions abundant are fragments of bitumen coated mats small baskets here in the middle والعديد من الأدوات المصنوعة من هذه المادة مادة الصلصال تقنيات البحث البيئي بالتفصيل هناك ثلاثة تقنيات أساسية اعتمدت خلال العمل استخدام الميكروسكوب إذا نتائج الأبحاث التي أجريت لاحظ أن ما من بقايا للنباتات في الطبقات الحجرية التي تم تحليلها أكثر من 100 
date uh, stone imprints in bitumen هناك مئة قطعة حجرية منقوشة عليها مصنوعة من الصلصال Archaeology was uh, also uh, presented by, by Mark. You can uh, uh, to the end. How uh, can we portray the archaeology uh, in the bronze age? Uh, uh, present the settlement was uh, early occupied during the first half of the second millennium. بنيت هذه المستوطنة في الجزء الثاني من الألفية الثانية قبل الميلاد وأيضا كانت هناك حياة عليها في الألف الثالث الموقع كان يستخدم ربما كميناء وهذا ما تشير إليه الأختام هناك تساؤلات حول التطور التطور الجغرافي الشكلي للموقع عبر العصور بناء على العوامل المناخيه في حقبه ما قبل التاريخ اذا الاستيطان في موقع الخضر كان استيطانا موسميا على الارجح من قبل الصيادين هذا مبين في الهندسه المستطيله لل is the important part of Archidea Bronze Age history. What to say for conclusion, the drone picture of the site can be viewed as comprehensive. The scientific analysis have been opening new questions for future. The and is promising a very tempting view beyond the current scientific state of the research of the Bronze Age on Phylaka and the Thank you, Dr. Peter. We go straight to Dr. Aisha Abu Laban. On the island Phylaka, there is evidence of use of seals from the late third millennium BC and six, seven hundred years after, uh, onwards. In my presentation, I will focus on a specific group of seals, style two seals. This is a distinct group. With the exception of one fragment found on the settlement of Sar in Bahrain, all examples of style two seals have been found on Feylaka. Um, I will first offer a revised dating of style two seals I will then discuss its iconography, its morphology, and its use. And I will uh, suggest possible, possible factors for the emergence of, of this style. Now, Dr. Fleming Hoylon was supposed to tell about uh, our uh, recent results from the excavations from 2008 to 2012. He was unable to come, so I will just give you some small, uh, brief insights in my presentation. Um, the study is based on field work carried out by the Kuwaiti Danish archaeological mission to Feylaka, which has since 2008 excavated on F6 and lately on F3. The project is run by Moscow Museum in Denmark, headed by Dr. Fleming Hoylund, with the support and collaboration of the Kuwait National Council of Culture, Arts and Letters. The aim of the project is to re-evaluate on the occupation hist uh, history on Feylaka during the second millennium BC. 
the results I present here are also based on my, my PhD project. Mm -hmm. Thank you for calling me doctora, but I'm still not doctora yet, maybe, inshallah, one and a half years or two mm -hmm. years. <laughs> I'll do my best. <laughs> So uh, um, this study is based on my PhD project on the seal corpus from Felica. In addition to more than 70 seals retrieved from our recent excavations on if 6 I was granted access by uh, the museum uh, to the seals from the previous excavations conducted on the southwestern area of the island uh, since the 1950s. Uh, the complete corpus includes more than 500 seals from the sites F3, F5, F6, and, F6, and from unknown proveniences. And I could also compare it to the ones on Al Khidr from the recent publication. As mentioned earlier, our work uh, concentrated on Tel F6, which so far re re uh, revealed to be an area of uh, public buildings, a temple, and a palace. In the 1980s, uh, the French mission uncovered the remains of a temple building, which was founded during the early part of the second millennium BC. From our excavation south of the temple, we uncovered remains of a terrace connected to the temple, and below that were remains uh, of a five meter long wall, which proved to be from the late third millennium BC. Um, so maybe approximately at the end of or three period. So, uh, and together with that were uh, pottery dated to the or three, and as you can see, the cylinder seal, which shows a presentation scene, and the owner uh, ha is a scribe with a Sumerian name. So these discoveries add to the uh, general understanding of the taking place during this period. I will now focus on the area e uh, east of the palace. The palace was excavated by the Danish mission in the 1950s. The mission resumed excavation there in the 1970s. The building held an, administ uh, an administrative function and possibly also related to larger production enterprises. The palace was constructed at the temple. Um, how much later is still uncertain, but we uncovered below the, the temp uh, sorry, below the palace two uh, what seems to be non-domestic buildings and probably public buildings then. Um, the first building was built on virgin soil of which remains of a wall up to 80 centimeter wide was uncovered. Associated to this wall were rectangular shaped hearths, so the area was used for open door communal activities possibly. The, the building was then demolished, and then uh, another building was constructed with, a, with walls, however, up to 40 centimeter wide. Associated to this building, what I've marked here with white, is a paved area, and east of that are these two parallel walls, which of a kiln. The building was then demolished and then a 50 centimeter thick clay, clay substance was covered the buildings and then the, the palace was constructed and the area was still used for open door, maybe communal activities as this trough shaped kiln uh, was, uh, was situated just a couple of meters uh, from the palace corner wall. Analysis of the pottery shows that the two buildings and the early part of the palace belong to period one to two, but most likely period two. Uh, that is between 2000 to 1800 BC, which you know, was a time where Feilaka and the rest of Dilmun was flourishing, uh, being the main mediator for copper trade and thus benefiting highly from the copper demand from the Lhasa kings. The seals uncovered from these layers um, with the two lowermost buildings were of the, you know, the early known style, style 1A and style 1B. And these two styles are very common, both in Feilaka and the rest of the Dilmun. Um, with the layers associated with the construction of the palace, we now see this emergence of this new uh, style, style 2. Um, previously, because of lack of reliable context and a low number of seals, um, it has been suggested by Keom that it should be dated around the old Babylonian period. Um, but now that we have uh, these remains, we can safely say that it was uh, at least introduced maybe during the uh, late part of 19th uh, century BC or early part 18th century BC.
this is um, so now that we can offer some more reliable data to the seals, I will discuss the different elements of the seals and put it within this historical framework. This is just, just to show you a distribution of the seals on Feilaka according to their style. Just briefly, you can see the early types uh, up the early type of theirs, that 1A, is characterized by these deep engravings, and then they become more elaborate. And then we have star 1B, which, which is a little bit more, less deep and a little bit less elaborate, more sketchy. And then we have star 2, as you can see, smaller, finer tools have been used to carve the seals. Then I have star 3, but I will not get, go into that, just to show you this is from the, what, con um, uh, from the cassite layers and the gulf, you know, this is one of the earlier types, so. Um, the three lines on the back with four dots uh, in circles uh, remain a solid signature uh, on style two seals. However, the tools, as mentioned, uh, used to carve the seals are now smaller and finer scale. Um, there are also some differences in the shape, iconography, and the way the style two might have been worn that I will discuss. This is very, very simplified, just to show you that there was a larger vari variety in the morphological attributes of the earlier style uh, in their style one seals. However, with style two, this is very confined to the classic, you know, classic Dillman type, which is a dome back with a, with a disc. We actually mm -hmm. found only one example of a bifacial seal. And I don't wanna trouble you with a lot of statistics, uh, but believe me if I, when I say that. Also, um, the difference in the sizes of the seal, um, the variety in the size is um, lower. Uh, so we have a little bit smaller size, sized style two seals and less vari variety in their sizes. So a very restricted and confined type of seals. And we also, uh, we also have some examples made of seashell wood could uh, point to some local production. Now, uh, I will talk about the iconography. If you look at the themes or scenes uh, displayed, uh, they are also very restricted to what I would say three main themes. The radial scenes where you can see the motifs are centered around a central motif, typically a rosette, and then you have a, a line of animals, sometimes also humans and objects. The second um, theme is you have a bullman or a human f uh, flanking or holding animals. And the third one, which I will call uh, so prayer scene or standard scenes, that is where you have standards uh, and they are flanked by bullmen, animals, and also monkeys. Um, the restricted iconography of style two seal stands in contrast <coughs> to the large vari variety of different themes and scenes carried on style 1A and 1B seals. This counts everything from drinking scenes, scenes with an offering table, capturing of animals, uh, erotic scenes, boat scenes, you, you name it. There are two prominent figures in style 1A and to a lesser extent on style 1B seals, which are uh, absent in style 2 seals. The human wearing a flounced garment and the anthro sorry, anthropomorphized DT who wears a horned headdress. Mm. Now, if the human motif with a garment is a key figure, especially in style one a seals. The way this type of person is displayed denotes a person of a higher rank. This seal is a good example of how his rank and position is visually emphasized. The seal was found just east of the corner of the palace, possibly discarded with the demolishing of the public building, buildings below the palace. Its size, 5.28 uh, centimeters in diameter, is one of the largest seals uh, so far uncovered of Star 1A. And the four lines on the back, which is unique, could be an expression of ownership of a person with a higher rank. Hmm. The human motifs, as you can see, you have the one with the flounce garment on the top, the one with the plain garment in the middle, and the lower one is the nude. The other figure who is completely absent is the anthropomorphized deity. He or she appears generally in a sitting position, centrally placed 
on the seal, and if not, dominating in size, as this example showed, which we uncovered in the 2010 season. The, the DT is typically shown engaged in drinking scenes, etc. It is impossible, excuse me, okay. It is impossible to provide answers at this time of why these two figures were no longer displayed uh, on Style 2 seals. I would suggest that this could be sought in the increasing appearance of the bull man in Style 2 seals. Turning to a considera consideration of the bull man, this mythological figure has the upper body and head uh, and legs of a bull, and this figure appears in only few of the early seals, um, while in Style 2, there is a high frequency. The bowmen always stand, uh, generally assuming uh, the same role as humans holding animals, holding a podium, and directing his arms towards a standard. In fact, bowmen are never uh, shown together with divine figures. Indeed, ha he has divi divine attributes. If we look at, he has hairlock, like uh, this example, like the, the anthropomorphized deity, and he also has these multiple horns. Um, you know, if we draw some parallels, we know from Mesopotamian sources uh, that the bullman can act somehow on behalf of the god. Um, looking at how the bullman is displayed on Dilmun seals in relation to human motifs, when standing together with a nude figure, he is in front, so marking a higher position or higher, more importance, and when displayed with a human motif in a flounced garment, he seems to be on an equal position. I don't know what, you, what to make of it right now, but this could indicate that the bullman in Dilmun iconography uh, can be, I don't know if you can say substitute, but has both uh, some abilities which um, corresponds to the one of a human with a high rank and also divine authority. The last point regarding the bullman I would like to make is his facial attributes. This chart here uh, shows how the human figures and bull bullmen are displayed through time. In the earlier seals, much effort has been put on rendering details of the fac facial features of the humans. Uh, as you can see, they have this um, uh, cap-like head uh, with a triangular eye shape and triangular nose and the lips and the chin or beard. And these features through time, as you can see, are less pronounced. And with actual style 1B, um, the facial features can be absolutely lacking, giving this the human and the bullman somehow an anonymous uh, character. Uh, but if we look at, the, there are a number of examples of style two seals with the bullman where he regains some of these facial features as now he gets his eyes back, um, eye details. So there is somehow during, with this, with the style two, a very strong emphasis on this bullman. Um, Another thing that I would like to discuss is um, the arm or hand gesture. In early group of seals when humans, bullmen, and even monkeys are shown, they're always shown holding each other, objects, or other symbols. Their arm gesture and their touching of hand denotes a coherence or interconnectivity between these different subjects. This norm, however, changes slightly or to some extent with style two seals. Um, so this point leads us back to the prayer slash standard mm. seals, um, where the central figure is typically a standard or an astral symbol. There are, here we see there are examples of humans or bullmen. We have these examples where they hold the standard, but now we also see this new gesture where you have your arms, where the arms are in a vertical position, directed towards the standard without touching. Um, and you can see the details of the fingers indicate that they, you know, they're not supposed to touch. Um, if you look at uh, our neighboring re neighbor region, Mesopotamia, we know that from 
Sumerian and Akkadian expressions for hand lifting in an upward motion, this is implicitly and explicitly a gesture directed to a deity. And lifting a hand could be understood as a nonverbal greeting. From Mesopotamian iconography, we see that the hand lifting in connection with a person, a subordinate, approaching a deity which, or a king, thus an authority, has usually one arm or both arms in a vertical position. And this is responded by the deity, however, in a horizontal position. This denotes the asymmetrical relationship between the two subjects, the subordinate and the authority. Um, but we don't have that in Dillman iconography. But we have this vertical position, again, signifying some kind of a prayer or greeting to this standard, which might be then an objectified um, deity. Um, and, and as we see the examples of a crescent and a radiating star, maybe this could be symbols of the god Sin and the radiating sun, uh, the god Shamish. If we go back to and try to grasp some of these ideas to the Mesopotamian glyptic, uh, which are contemporary to star two seals, he, uh, the bull man is typically shown in contest with lions, animals, and the nude hero. And he can also grasp a spear or hold a gatepost. But there are also now an, a lot of examples where the bullmen are holding um, the, the Shamash god symbol. So maybe there are some shared uh, ideological and iconographic displays here. The last aspect which I would like to address is the web pattern on, sea, uh, on the seals. Now, from the very few fragments we have of impressions of seals, there are actually, we have, uh, there's one on, yeah, Al-Khadr, and then we have also one on F3, where we can see it's an impression of a style two seal. So there's no doubt that they were used in connection with administrative economic purposes. Um, I will just look, uh, tell you something about the wear pattern. Um, if we look at the suspension holes, uh, there are some, there is a pattern in how they are worn. Um, typically, um, when we look at the star 1A seals, we can see the pattern on the upper end of the suspension hole. Mm. Uh, this needs, of course, further investigation, but you know, this could indicate that the seal were worn around the neck as the string will cause the wear from the weight of the stone uh, up in the upper part. Looking at star 1B seals, the suspension holes are now typically or, uh, worn all around the place, and the disc edge is heavily worn and sometimes so flattened. And we have actually, uh, especially with the star 1B seals, some, um, uh, some uh, uh, which are so worn, and actually some evidence of that they might be sort of further polished at the disc edges, so maybe they were then reused as pendants or some sort. But this wear uh, near the <laughs> disc edge could also implicate that they were combined, they were put together with other objects. Now, if we look at the style two seal, seal we have some examples where the, the, the suspension hole, I'm almost finished, is oval shaped, but we have also a lot of examples where the wear is also concentrated around the, um, the disc edge where the suspension holes are. This could maybe imply that now uh, the, the, the style two seals and one B seals uh, are worn as wrists, as um, maybe the string will be sort of, you know, wearing the, the disc area. Uh, but of course, this needs some more further investigation. And this is just an example of a seal we uncovered from our season from style three. And you can see we have, there's a copper string or ring in C2. So maybe could we, uh, it was worn as a ring. Um, and so another way of wearing it. Besides the changes in the shape and the iconography of the seals, there seemed to be a gradual change in the way seals were worn and then displayed outside. To sum up, 
From our recent excavation, we can confidently place the appearance of style two seals at least in the late 19th century BC, uh, a period where Dimlin and Felica still played a call, uh, key role in the trade of cover. The emergence of the style, uniform in size, and iconographical elements, and its restriction to Felica suggests that we are dealing with a Felican uh, workshop, and thus a Felican style. Um, and the question will be whether this style emerged as maybe the center of Dilmun on Qalat al-Bahrain, in the northern part of Bahrain, was slowly going in decline, and the workshop of, of producing these uh, seals were maybe shifted now to Feylika. This is a good question. Hopefully, some of the questions and hypotheses posed here will be clarified in the nearest future. And at the end, I would like to express my warm thanks and gratitude to the National Council of Culture, Arts and Letters and the many people in the museum uh, and for entrusting me with this material and to uh, our team and Moscow Museum and Dr. Fleming Hoylund who challenged me to take this journey with the SEALs. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Aisha to be. Not doctor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to be, but to be. <laughs> to be. <laughs> a very interesting iconographic analysis of your style, too. I'm sure it will generate a lot of observations from the audience. We will go directly to Miss Anna Hilton, Dr. Anna Hilton. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, thank you for the introduction just before, and thank you for having me. It's a great pleasure to be here. The paper I present today uh, will shed light on a group of stone vessels uncovered at the second millennium settlements, more specific, from Tel F3, F5, and F6 on the island of Eilika, belonging to the state of Kuwait. In the period of 1958 to 63, Danish archaeological missions from the Moscow Museum in Denmark conducted excavations on Eilika. As a result of these missions, a large number of carved stone vessels and fragments were uncovered along with other second millennium material and architecture. Until now, ceramics, stamp seals and recently architecture from the 1958 to 63 missions have been published, whereas the stone vessels have remained largely unpublished until recently. In 2008, a Kuwaiti Danish team re-initiated the uh, investigations on the mounds that were excavated some 50 years earlier in order to shed light on some of the unanswered questions relating to the Bronze Age occupation on Filica. During these seasons, I have had the pleasure of studying an assemblage consisting of 775 vessel fragments which are kept here at the Kuwait National Museum. Additionally, a collection consisting of 690 pieces stored at the Moscow Museum were also analyzed. During the 2008 to 2012 excavations on Tel Aviv 6, additionally 111 shirts uh, have surfaced and these are currently being processed. As we are about to set out on a journey that took place some three and a half to four and a half thousand years ago, that involved trade over land and sea and relations between distant regions and people, a brief outline of the historical and geographical setting of the material will be provided. Filica enters the historical scene in the Bronze Age period shortly before 2000 BC, when it becomes associated with an expansion phase and economic flourish of the cultural entity of Dilmun. Dilmun was a culture consisting of seafaring merchants that shipped copper, beads, stone vessels, and other goods from the southern part of the Gulf, namely from the Oman Peninsula, but also from Iran and Indus up through the Gulf to Mesopotamia. Filica was embedded in the Dilmun domain as a trading outpost due to the island's strategic location, ideal for transfer and redistribution of goods and its fresh water supplies. It was on the southwestern shore of Filica that the 1958-63 expedition focused their work. The majority of the stone vessels were excavated at Tel Aviv 3, which includes a temple structure and a settlement dating back to the early 2nd millennium BC. The site contains several occupation phases with the latest around 1300 BC. 
Another area of focus was the so-called palace located at Tel 6. This large structure has a completely different and larger architectural layout than seen at the domestic quarters at uh, Tel 3. The palace dates from the early second millennium down to around 1400 BC. The Tel of F5 contains second millennium material, but no associated architecture has been excavated. F5 is dominated by overlying Hellenistic layers. The archaeological context of these stone vessels are sometimes vague, as stone plunders have disturbed the sites, both in antiquity and in modern times. Given these circumstances, the stone vessels were primarily dated on stylistic comparisons with material deriving from other Bronze Age uh, sites in the Near East. Different styles of carved soft stone vessels were in circulation during the Bronze Age and have been found widely distributed on sites in Iran, Mesopotamia, along the Gulf and on the Oman Peninsula. It was not until the early 1970s that the first actual studies and categorization of the different styles of decorated stone vessels were conducted. Since the past 40 years, several scholars such as Kuhl and Sarins, David and Velde have continued the work with the construction of typologies and labeled the different styles, which made them able to distinguish chronological and regional differences within the stone vessel repertoire. The majority of these vessels were excavated in contexts related to mortuary or ritual practices and dates from the middle of the third millennium BC to the end of the second millennium BC. In the Bronze Age light layers on Phylica, all of these styles were identified. I will just briefly comment on uh, the stones that were used to manufacture these vessels. And as you can see displayed here, a wide range of different types were used. The vast majority of the vessels were produced from so-called soft stones that include talc, chloride, and steatite. The remaining types are medium hard to hard stones and include calcite, basalt, dolerite, and limestone with fossil corals. These stones constitute only minor quantities of the complete assemblage. It should be noted that no soft stone sources have been attested on Phylica or mainland Kuwait, and stones therefore had to derive from elsewhere. The variation of stone types identified on Phylica reflects not only a diversity of taste and accessibility through time, but also disclosed information on the different routes of distribution and trade that these vessels were passed along some three and a half to four and a half thousand years ago. One of the oldest vessel groups, that of a third millennium figure to style, was identified on Phylica. These vessels are beautifully carved with figurative motifs such as specific hut or temple facade, combat scenes mainly between beasts and snakes that are timed or inlaid with semi-precious stones. And again, other decorations include imitations of basketry, textile, and bricks. These vessels are generally dated to around 2600 to 2300 BC. The Phylica sample seems to derive from Iranian workshops as they have similar shapes and were produced from the same greenish soft stone. Similar vessels have also been uncovered in Mesopotamian temples and graves and on the Saudi Arabian island of Tarut, but is otherwise little represented on sites situated on the eastern side of the Gulf. A small number of undecorated third millennium vessels were also uh, uncovered on Phylica. These types of vessels were in circulation in the Near East simultaneously with the aforementioned figurative group in the last part of the third millennium BC. These vessels likewise came from Iran as they've been found on a number of production sites such as Shaddad, attested by unfinished vessels that were found along with copper tools. They tend to have been disposed in mortuary context in Iran, but have also turned up in South Mesopotamian burials and temples. The value or significance of these vessels, at least for the kings of southern Mesopotamia, is practically written in stone. Cuneiform inscriptions document that these vessels were precious enough to be carried away from distant lands as booty, as booty later to be donated by the kings to their gods. A calcite shirt from Phylica carried a cuneiform inscription, but sadly too little was preserved in order to read it properly.
from around 2300, a new style of stone vessels known as Umana emerged. A number of these geometric decorated vessels were recognized in the Phylica assemblage. Umana vessels were produced on the Oman Peninsula and had different forms and set of decoration elements than the former styles just presented. The Umana vessels had uh, decoration incised into the surface in simple geometric patterns. This stands in contrast to the previous figurative decorations that were carved in a high relief. Here, the surfaces were removed around the motifs in order to make them stand out. Another observation includes a change of stone types used to manufacture these vessels. A departure from the characteristic greenish soft stone favored in the figurative style or the calcite and limestones used for the plain vessels to a number of gray stones were now preferred or at least available for the producers. The Umana vessels appear to have been distributed to a much lesser extent um, compared to the third millennium styles. From the beginning of the second millennium BC down to around 1600 BC, a new type of geometric decorated stone vessels called Wadisuk were produced on the Oman Peninsula. On Phylica, these vessels are relatively large and often show marks of use, including sooth and steering marks, suggesting that they were used in household contexts. It's been recorded that the distribution of Wadisuk vessels are limited beyond the Oman Peninsula, with only a few vessels found in South Mesopotamia, some along the Iranian coast, and on Bahrain. This notion is interesting since the quantities of Wadisuk are in fact, are in fact rather large and one of the most comprehensive groups of stone vessels identified on Phylica. The connection between the south and northern part of the Gulf appeared to have been maintained to some extent, attested by a number of late Bronze Age vessels. These are either plain or extensively decorated with geometric incisions and were produced in the period of 1600 to 1250 BC on the Oman Peninsula. On Phylica, a few of these stone vessels were found in the upper layers belonging to period 4A or 4B, which is around 1450 to 1300 BC. A number of vessels could not be fitted in with the established stone vessel styles. These vessels are unique and without matching parallels. At least none have been discovered so far. And this makes the question on provenience and dating rather challenging. It should be mentioned that a few of them have previously been noted by Paul Kerm and Teresa Howard Carter and Brenman Denton. In the assemblage, these three new groups were identified um, and currently called figurative, geometric, and plain phylica style. It should be noted that despite the different types of decoration, some overall morphological characteristics and stone types link them together. These, uh, several of these vessels were inscribed with, sorry, with cuneiform. These vessel groups separate themselves from the established types because of their different decoration layout, vessel shapes, and stone types. Based on these observations, it will be argued that these styles are distinct and were produced in different cultural spheres, both regionally and chronologically, than the well-established groups just presented. First, I'll introduce some of the figurative phylica vessels that will allow us a peek into the cultic lives of the second millennium people who manufactured and facilitated these containers. On a number of vessels, scenes of procession or worship are depicted. Here several examples are shown, such as humans raising their arms in front of their faces and sometimes carrying a tree branch. The worshippers are walking in line towards um, the celestial symbols that at times are carried on the backs of animals or towards <coughs> standards, altars or deities. Also mythical creatures such as bullmen are represented in these scenes. It is clear that some of these images are more fictional than real and must be understood as metaphors. From Mesopotamian iconography, we know that celestial symbols represent different deities. The sun represents the god of justice, Shamas, who is the heroic conqueror of night and death. He was the son of the moon god Sin, 
who is represented by a full moon or a crescent moon. The moon could also the moon god could also be depicted as a bull or a cattle herder. He was in particular worshipped in the marshy areas of southern Mesopotamia. Sin's daughter was the goddess Inanna, a fertility goddess whose symbol was the star of Venus. Together these gods formed a triad that were worshipped in the third and the second millennium BC. It is interesting that the joining of these three symbols are present on several of the figurative phylica vessels, as you can see displayed here. Another interesting vessel has a depiction of a large bearded male face with a rosette or disc on top of his head. The frontal depiction is unlike any other humanoid representation on the figurative phylica vessels. In a repeated pattern, three persons with arms raised walks in procession towards the face, and between their heads are low-lying crescent moons. The face is suggested to be a deity, even though his identity is unknown. It should be mentioned that a few parallels for the face are available from Phylica, including a number of style three seals and a small clay head with similar features. As no comparative vessels could be used to date this group, a number of other objects, such as Stillman se uh, seals in style three, figurines and altars from the Gulf region were used. Especially the style three seals require attention as both the seals and the figurative phylica style shares a number of iconogra iconographic similarities, such as worship scenes, humans with identical features, standards, and symbols. Some style three seals were inscribed with cuneiform, and cuneiform specialists such as Glasnier and Denton have suggested a date spanning from the late Old Babylonian period to the early Kassite period for these seals. This period coincides with period 3a to 3b on Phylica. A number of geometrically decorated vessels could not be grouped with the Umana, the Wadi Suk, or the late Bronze Age repertoire mm. due to the different vessel shapes and decoration layout. This group mainly consists of large rounded balls. It is suggested that this group, along with some of the plain phylica vessels of identical shape, were used in household context since they were exposed to heat and heavily worn. The plain phylica style includes a number of different types, but due to time limits, I'll mention just two specific shapes. One is a group of balls with characteristic concentric ridges near the base. This profile is also found on both the figurative and the geometric phylica styles. A few tentative parallels are available, although none of them are exact. One is a shirt from a burnt Kassite building on Bahrain, dating to around 1400 BC. This stone shirt is interesting to note since it has geometric decoration and a pierced lock handle, features that traditionally are associated with Wadisuk vessels. The second parallel is a small onyx vase found in a prince's tomb at Ebla, dating to the 17th century BC. Thirdly, although not produced from stone, a number of Iranian bronze vessels dating from the very end of the third millennium BC down to around the middle of the second millennium BC. These tentative parallels can serve as an indication on how to date these vessels, placing them within a time frame from the very end of the third millennium BC to the middle of the second millennium BC. The second type is um, a plate or a small altar. Some are plain, while others are inscribed with cuneiform. The 1958-63 to 63 missions uncovered seven of these plates, and one of them carried a cuneiform inscription possibly mentioning the name of a temple. The 2008 to 2012 missions found several more of these plates, and the name of Insak is incised on one of them. Similar plates have also turned up in the French and in the Slovak excavations on Phylica. Oh, sorry. Um, the purpose of these plates or altars are not entirely clear, but they seem to be related to temples and cultic rituals based on the cuneiform inscriptions. A somewhat similar altar plate displayed at the British Museum might aid the understanding of this vessel type, as it is dedicated to the high priestess of the moon god at Ur. 
This reinforces the idea of these vessels being used in cultic settings. As mentioned, all of the three newly identified vessel groups have shirts that were inscribed with cuneiform. These inscriptions seem to place these vessels in cultic settings. As the writing mentioned, local deities such as Paniba and Insak of Agarum, the patron god of Dilmun. Furthermore, an old temple, as well as the temple of Insak, is mentioned on these shirts. The stone vessels from Phylica demonstrate a diverse assemblage that can be separated into eight main groups. Based on stylistic comparisons, the assemblage was now dated, uh, was dated and now I will briefly discuss how the different styles relate to the settlement phases. The third millennium style, that of the figurative style, the undecorated groups, and the Umana style, all date mostly prior to the settlement phases until F3 and F6 and F5. It should, however, be mentioned that the 2008 to 2012 investigation until F6 uncovered layers dating to the Ur 3 period, and in these layers, a few third millennium undecorated calcite vessels were excavated. The third millennium vessels were found scattered in layers dated to all periods, but with the greatest concentration in layers dating from period 3A to 4B, which roughly corresponds to around 1700 to 1300 BC. The third millennium material was found in later contexts, might suggest a different and secondary use on Phylica. These shirts occasionally had secondary cutting marks, intentional breaks, and were reworked into new objects such as blanks, pendants, spindle worlds, and tools. It is therefore suggested that some of the third millennium vessels derived on the island after they fell out of use and had circulated in the Gulf region for a period before they ended up on Phylica in second millennium context to serve as raw material for new objects. The remaining style groups, that of Wadi Suk and Late Bronze Age, dating to the following second millennium BC, as well as the new identified styles, all date contemporary with the settlement phases on Phylica. It is not surprising to find Wadi Suk vessels in all settlement layers, though with the greatest concentration in period two, around 1800 BC, or that the Late Bronze Age vessels first appear in the upper layers. What is soot vessels appear to have been used on a household level as traces of soot, heat, residue, and numerous wear marks are present. Vessels were not immediately discarded when broken, but mended and then further utilized, if not recarved into new objects. As for the new second millennium groups, that of the figurative and the geometric and the plain phylica styles, these were found in layers dating from period 3a to 4b. The figurative phylica vessels lack domestic marks, and judging from their decoration, which often depicts worship and procession scenes, and the cuneiform references, these vessels should likely be associated with cultic practices. The same goes for some of the plain phylica style vessels that include either cuneiform dedications or were delicately executed. The majority of the plain and the geometric phylica style vessels appear to have been used in household contexts similar to the Wadi Suk vessels. In terms of dating these uh, three style groups, there are no precise evidence for their date. <laughs> and the, but the close similarity between the figurative phylica style and the style three stamp seals point to a second millennium date, somewhere from period 3a into period 3b which in Mesopotamian terms correspond to the late Old Babylonian, early Kassite period. These specific vessels were reused on Phylica from period 4a. It is likely that the new styles were produced in the Arabian Gulf, but whether they were purely of local origin can be discussed. There are clear influences from the southern Dilmun traditions and the choices of stone types used for these vessels. Nevertheless, influences from Mesopotamian iconography and cuneiform signs are also present. 
It is interesting that the dating of these vessels around 1700 to 1450 BC is contemporary with the first Sealand dynasty lying just north of Phylica in the marshy areas of southern Mesopotamia. The ceramic tradition on Phylica in these periods also shows influences from the north, but as the southern Mesopotamia falls under a dark age during this period, this connection still remains on a speculative level. And with these words, I'll end my presentation on the amazing and very interesting collection of stone vessels excavated on Phylica. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. On time, Ms. Hilton. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, uh, I think we turn to quickly entertain some uh, questions and comments from the uh, audience. I already have two have preempted the early questions. May I suggest that we confine uh, our comments oh, to a specific, you know, of the presenters. In other words, if you want to direct your comment or question to Dr. Pete or to uh, Dr. Abu Laban or uh, Dr. Hilton. I am only in what relates to the Bronze Bronze Age. Bronze Age is a period of time تختلف يختلف تحديد من منطقة إلى منطقة أخرى برونز إيج يختلف تحديد هذه الفترة زمنيا من منطقة إلى أخرى لكن هذه المنطقة منطقة الخليج العربي تم أو شبه اتفاق بأن هذه الفترة هي فترة حضارة دلم فلماذا لا نتفق على أن نطلق على كل ما تفضل فيه الدكتور كارل بفترة حضارة دلمون كي لا نحدد الفترة الزمنية السؤال الآخر أو أكثر من سؤال للدكتورة عائشة إن شاء الله طبعا هذا التصنيف اللي طرحتي هو اعتمده بول كيرم في تصنيف أختام فيلكة في الأولى والفئة الثانية والثالثة واعتمد على الشكل الخارجي للختم ظهر الختم طبعا الآن هذه الترتيبة في التصنيف هل احنا نستمر عليه هذا السؤال الأولي لأنني أنا شخصيا ومن خلال طبعا جهود فردية في دراسات متواضعة أرى بأن هذه الاختلافات في الزخرفة في نقش الختم سببها هي الاختلاف في قدرة الفنان في تنفيذ العمل لأن أغلب الأختام اللي اكتشفناها في البحرين واستطعنا فرزها وتصنيفها زمنيا بالرغم من أنها تعود إلى نفس الفترة الزمنية إلا أن هذا التصنيف المعتمد على طراز 1 وطراز 2 موجود فيه فمعناته هل طراز 1 استمر في طراز 2 أو طراز لأن هاي فترات زمنية نتحدث عنها فأنا رجائي أن نهتم بهذه المنطقة يعني بهذا الأمر ولا نتبع هذا التقسيم الذي طرحه بول كيرم ويشكر عليه في فترته قبل 15-20 سنة الأمر الآخر الرجل الثور طبعا يتكرر في أختام بلاد الرافدين وهو تأثير ثقافي على هذه المنطقة وعلى أسلوب الفني الذي اعتمده الفنان الدلموني أو أنا أسميه الحرفي الدلموني لأن هذه صارت حرفة لدى مجموعة وهذه الأختام اللي عرفتيه مجموعات كبيرة منها تتشابه تماما ما اكتشفناه في مملكة البحرين وفي أغلب المواقع سواء كانت ستلمنت أو في المقابر بريا المون شكرا شكرا أسئلة جدا مهمة خلي الدكتور بيتر يجاوب على طرحك الأول Process is a generally um, term for uh, uh, part of the human civilization, but why not uh, Bronze Age? Bronze Age is general, and the human civilization is a part of them. This both is, is okay. It's Would that satisfy you? Well, uh, that's not fine for me. It's okay. I'm not sure. 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 I'
يعني أنا الملاحظة اللي ذكرته أن هذه الفترة أنه في العصر البرونزي في شمال أفريقيا إذا اتفقنا عليه يختلف عن العصر البرونزي في أوروبا يختلف عن العصر البرونزي في الخليج في بلاد الرافدين في الشرق في الميدل إيست الشرق العصر البرونزي محددة فترة إذا نطلق هذه هذا العصر البرونزي على هذه الفترة في الخليج تختلف عن الموجود العصر البرونزي فترة في أوروبا شكرا بس هذا اللي أردت أوضع والأمر متروك لك دكتور I don't know which one you mean Bronze Age in, in Europe or in the Gulf area yeah, It's a bit a philosophical, philosophical question Yes it is There is some Dilmun says that your classification is not very clear mm -hmm. between type 1 and type 2 mm -hmm. Type 1 it is earlier and discovered not only in Failaka, Kuwait, and Bahrain. Discovered some of them in Indus Valley, in Mohenjo-daro, and also in Ur. Leonardo, when he excavated in uh, Ur uh, uh, graves, he finds some of Dilmun seals. There is Indus inscription on it. And also in Bahrain, Jeffrey Beebe, he discovered some Indus inscription in Bahrain fort site, and there is some Dilmun seals discovered in the burial mounds. There is Indos inscription also. And they, they discovered also in Indos yeah. Valley in Mohenjo-daro some Dilmun seals. That is which they call it Gulf seals, which you mentioned. And there is difference between Gulf seals and Dilmun seals. And both they consider them Dilmun seals. And the, the, the ball head, the ball, half man, half mm -hmm. ball, that is uh, in the Mesopotamian and the cylinder seal, they consider it a Gilgamesh. So what is the and observation, the, please? The, we want to come and, to And the, the, the Dilmun seals usually in the burial mounds in Bahrain, they find it. And also in the burial complex, it is uh, near the ribs. That means it was hanging in the neck. And that's it. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Can you direct to Dr. Yes. Um, should I answer the question? Yes, now? please. Okay. I'll just briefly um, comment on what you just um, mentioned. Um, I, I, I only had 20 minutes, so I, I couldn't clarify the whole stratigraphy and the dating of the all different styles of seals. Yes, there, um, there have been found these so-called Gulf type seals outside the so-called Dillman region, and we have some of the earlier style 1A seals also found outside the Dillman region, as you mentioned in Ur, in Susa, uh, and other settlements. Yes, that's true. Uh, but we ha don't have any of the 1B and style 2 seals outside of Dillman. Um, and yes, the Bullman is known from other glyptic art, but I'm really interested in understanding why this emphasis on the Bullmans emerging with the style 2 seals. Um, why is there a high frequency and why is he gaining this importance uh, as a mythological figure? Uh, he's, a, he's, he's sort of displayed on a secondary basis, if you can say that, on Mesopotamian glyptic um, in many examples. So, and no, he's not a Gilgamesh. He was, uh, he's not uh, the Gilgamesh figure. So. Um, you Dr. Suela, yeah, yes. his comment. Uh, yes, with Kerem, uh, to some, I mean, that's what I also, I took the Style 2 group and I revi revised uh, the dating of Style 2 group, uh, which Kerem uh, suggested, because the Style 2 seals were, at that time, only found uh, in a low quantity. And actually, 42% of the Style 2 seals found in Al-Khidr, uh, sorry, 42% of the seals found in Al-Khidr um, are Style 2. So um, I'm really interested in the near, fu near future uh, when further study on Al-Khidr is conducted to see, uh, I think this is really an interesting site, uh, and why do we find that many on style two? Uh, it's, uh, of course, a very limited um, occupation area, uh, limited in time, so this is really interesting and will add further to, to, to the dating of the seal. But so far, with the uh, discoveries uncovered uh, uncovering seals, Kerm's um, 
suggestions hold more or less. And uh, Anna had also some um, um, additions to because she was looking at the at the stone vessels, which ha which are comparable to style three. They sort of are really of the same family. <laughs> so uh, she had also some suggestions there, which also hold, I would say. So, so I would say, yeah, to, mo uh, to, to the extent so far, and from our discoveries on, on if six, of, on if six um, yeah, we couldn't add further to that, other than we could verify that we have a style one A seal and uh, used together with 1B, and then the emergence of style 2. The question is, of course, um, I don't know, the, uh, it would be hard to see, so how the, uh, the duration of the use of style 1A, how long was it used? Uh, that's, that's a good question, because we, s we find it in, co in same layers, in the same context as style 2 seals, but maybe they were no longer um, um, functioning as seals as such. Um, it's really hard. It's really hard uh, to answer that. Um, I would say, um, but we find them in the same layers. Um, so I, I don't know if that sort of answered your questions. I think that that would for the moment because we have three other comments mm -hmm. from others uh, questioners. We have nine minutes, so we'll divide between the three speakers and comments. Three, three, three. Start uh, with Dr. Carter, then uh, Ms. Dr. Ali, and uh, start Isa. I, uh, this question for Anna. Um, I was interested in the Umana uh, soft stone uh, because it, it appears quite a long time after the end of the Umana period. Yeah. Um, and in fact, it seems to appear later than the Wadi Souk style stuff mm. on Phylica. Um, and you, you kind of answered the question when you mentioned recycling. So I was wondering if there was uh, any other evidence that uh, the entirety of that corpus of Umana style soft stone mm. was brought in as, as kind of re you know, uh, brought in, in as raw material, as you put mm. it. Yeah, as, uh, a, as, as vessels. Um, I, th I think so to some extent. The Umana vessels had very few wear marks. Sure. No soot were sort of deposited on them. Yeah. They were in a very good condition often. Sure. And then they have the cutting marks on them. And to me, that seems to indicate that it, they sort of could have been imported as raw material to yeah. be used for facility for some other purpose. Dr. Ali. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Bidayatan al hiyiga hab ashkur al majlis al watani al thakafa fi dawlat al kuwait wa ashkur zumalaina al ladina. قاموا على هذا التنظيم الرائع الجميل كما أشكر رئيس الجلسة والمتحدثين في هذه الجلسة الغنية الحقيقة من الأشياء التي طرحت في تاريخ الخليج العربي في الكويت <تصفيق> طبعا أنا الحقيقة من خلال عرض الدكتور بلازي صويلة يعني عمل حقيقة عملية جمع أو حضارة لديلمون بإلقائه الضوء على جميع المواقع الأثرية التي تعود لتلك الفترة ولذلك حسسنا في محاضرته أن هناك civilization called ديلمون at that time وهذا طبعا شيء جميل جدا الربط بين مواقع الأثار في الخليج العربي يجمعها وحدة حضارية كاملة ممكن تعريفها والإشادة بها والحديث عنها خاصة أن نتحدث أيضا حتى عن التنظيم الإداري لتلك الحضارة الواقع أيضا من خلال ما طرح عن بعض المعثورات في الخليج أيضا هذه تبرهن على أن هناك وحدة حضارية للخليج العربي وهذه الوحدة وراءها أيضا منطقة أمدتها وتمدها وترتبط بها وهي جزيرة العرب ولذلك من خلال النظر إلى اللقاء الأثرية والمكتشفات الأثرية في المملكة العربية السعودية 
ودول مجلس التعاون نجد أن هناك وحدة مهمة جدا جدا يجب أن يؤخذ بها وينظر إلى ما اكتشف في منطقة الخليج بشكل عام فمثلا من خلال تجربتي في جنوب الظهران أجد أن كل ما طرح وكل ما عرض من مأثورات أثرية أيضا موجودة في جنوب الظهران ولم يتطرق إليها في أثناء الحديث عن حضارة دلمون هذه يعني هذه الحضارة الموجودة في في منطقة الظهران في شرق الجزيرة العربية في المملكة العربية السعودية هي يعني أشياء مكتشفة واكتشفت ونشرت من خلال يعني أعمال إدارة الآثار في المملكة العربية السعودية ولم يتطرق إليها يعني فقط تطرق عن بعض الموجودات في مسقار وبعض الموجودات في الكويت وبعض الموجودات في البحرين فقط تاروت <تصفيق> تاروت أيضا عندما نتحدث عن تاروت شيء جميل جدا أن نرى أن تاروت هي جزيرة جامعة لكل ما عثر عليه في مواقع الخليج العربي التي تنتمي إلى حضارة دلمون النقطة الثانية التي أحب أن أركز عليها هي عملية المحلية في تلك المواقع لم يشار إليها لما نتكلم مثلا عن الستون فيزل نتكلم عن تأثيرات من إيران وتأثيرات من العراق فقط ومن الأندس فالي ولكن لا نتحدث أيضا عن المحلية والصناعة يعني من خلال مكتشفاتنا في جزيرة ثاروت اكتشفنا أواني أواني حجرية أنفنشت يعني معناته أنها مصنعة في محليا فلماذا نلقي المحلية في عملية المكتشفات الأثرية الدكتور صويلح في أثناء محاضرته كان ركز على أيضا المحلية لتلك المواقع وأن لها مواصفات أيضا مهمة جدا حتى بالنسبة للستامز للأختام عندنا أختام محلية تنتمي وترتبط بالأختام المحلية التي وجدت في مواقع أخرى في جزيرة العرب. شكرا. From what I understood from the comment, I'm sure it applies to all three speakers. He he is asking you whether in your comparative analysis, seals on the one hand and stone vessels, and in general the Al-Khidr findings. Was there any reference to materials discovered in Tarut and South Dahran? This is back in the 1970s. He's referring to uh, uh, some um, uh, tremendous corpus of data, especially seals and uh, stone vessels. So please have a, a yes, chance to course. respond. I mean, of course, we look to these regions too, and we make parallels. But as this is only 20 minutes, we have to shorten it down. But of course, this is the main place where we start to look, and then we expand our areas all the time. Um, about the unfinished vessels that you were talking about, I don't know if you're referring to the ones on Tarut from the third millennium. Mm. Um, I think, I don't know if I didn't make my point clear about these unique styles from Phylicap, but I'm quite convinced mm. that these are of local uh, origins as well uh, because they have the great similarities mm. with the stamp seals that were also produced here. So of course I'm not just looking for for parallels elsewhere but if I don't have any I have to expand my area in order to try to make sense of my material at least. Thank you very much. The last question and comment from uh, Mr. Isa Tfadda. Shukran. I have a short question and I also have a بالنسبة للتعقيب على تسمية حضارة دلمون على الخليج أنا أعتقد أن هذا يعني ممكن إجحاف لمناطق أخرى مثل شبه جزيرة عمان والتي فيها أيضا ماجان وتعدين النحاس وأهمية المنطقة تاريخيا وسلطنة عمان والإمارات غنية أيضا بالمواقع الأثرية فلا بد اختيار أجزاء لإلقاء الضوء عليها والأسماء بالنسبة للعصر البرونزي عندما نتحدث عن عصر البرونزي وامتدادات عصر البرونزي عندي سؤال لأستاذ أنا أو الدكتور أنا بخصوص الأواني الاستياتايت 
في شبه جزيرة عمان دائما أواني الاستيتايت الألف الثاني نعثر عليها في المدافن يعني معظم مواقعنا من الألف الثاني أو أغلبها إذا ما كانت تسعين بالمئة فكلها مدافن والأواني الاستيتايت التي عرضت عرضتها أيضا تم العثور عليها في مدافن كثيرة هل تجد العلاقة ما بين المدافن أو استخداماتها في المدافن في في شبه جزيرة عمان لها علاقة بفيلكة لأن ما ما عثرت عليه ليست في مدافن في مواقع استيطانية في من ضمن القطع الأواني الحجرية في آنية حجرية لها أربع معالق اللي صورتها في الخارج استخدمت كمبخرة دائما احنا نعثر عليها في في مدافننا مع الغطاء يوجد لها غطاء ايضا نعثر عليها في المدافن هل تعتقد هي استخدمت كما كما هو مذكور ان صنعت خصيصا كمجمره او مبخره ام هي استخدامات لها استخدامات اخرى بخصوص الاقراص الغزل اللي عرضتها سبندنج لور عندنا في في منطقه مليحه نفس هذه الصناعه لنفس الاقراص الغزل ونفس التقنيه يعني موجودة في فترة تعود إلى القرن الأول قبل الميلاد إلى القرن الأول الثاني الميلادي فهل هذه الأقراص المغازل التي عرضتها تعود إلى العصر البرونزي وهل هذا امتداد إلى العصر أو إلى فترات لاحقة أم لا شكرا وشكرا شكرا كلير؟ I don't know if there is a connection, of course, between what you have in the burials and what we have on Phylica. I made one observation, which I, I don't know where it would lead, but you often have in the burials on your Mark Peninsula, on your stone vessels, small incisions on the handles and near the rim, sort of like a scarification. And I have a few on Phylica. So I don't know if there's been some naughty people <laughs> down. <laughs> <laughs> Somewhere, <laughs> I don't know. Well, with that, I think I uh, can declare this to be a very engaged session the afternoon, and I thank the speakers and I thank the audience for their uh, interaction with the uh, presentations. And we have maybe less than five minutes recess, and we can rejoin. And Dr. Peter will take the chair. Thank you very much. <laughs>